Welcome to everybody here today. So uh, I think it's so exciting to be part of this uh, moment on the planet, actually, because so much is happening for exactly women. And um, today we want to talk about also how we as women can, and the men that are, if they want to be part of it, build bridges. Build bridges um, not only um, amongst each other and people of different countries, but different generation, different backgrounds, different projects, with a with a vision and a hope to build a world that really can work for all. And uh, one of the key messages of Win or advocacy work has also been that, and still is that of giving value not only to women, but also the qualities of the feminine. In the yin yang, as the Chinese would say, or the feminine masculine uh, balance, we see that if the feminine were values such as beauty, such as intuition, such as receptivity, such as long-term thinking, such as caring and sharing, we see that these are not always been appreciated enough. And to create a balance is important to care for each other, to care for nature, in the workplace, in society, and in our own lives, is becoming very, very important. And it's becoming so clear. There was a time where we could exist without really thinking so much about it. It was just about the masculine creating productivity, goal setting, structures. We need all of it, but we need the balance. And this is becoming more and more important. So we also want to look at how can we create bridges also on that between the masculine and the feminine. How can we give value to the feminine? Because I know so many women, and I'm sure you feel that inside yourself too, that work every day with some of these values, a balance perhaps also for women, and that often feel that it isn't valued enough. So in the light of our meeting today, being also part of Truth and Reconciliation Week, we want to face that truth and sort of reconcile also within us parts of us that maybe wasn't really valued enough and perhaps felt that that wasn't valued by others, by society, and maybe even by ourselves. So we want to cover a series of things and we're trying to weave all those topics together uh, as we are building bridges. And I think that knowing how to connect across borders and boundaries today is such a critical skill. We are living in a world where we have had many upheavals. I mean, every day, you know, there are demonstrations uh, that are happening, not only because of our different backgrounds, but we see with, during this part of COVID too, that the economic gap has widened. People are scared of work. There is a lot of other um, demonstrations going on. So, I think building bridges and knowing how to connect is important. And, um, and that is at the core of what we're doing. So today uh, we will listen to each other and we will have a chance also to go into small groups where we will share topics and do what we call networking with purpose, networking with joy. So we are talking, but we're not just chatting. We are growing and learning and exchanging together at the same time. And, and this is, uh, yeah, they do, knowing how to do that, I think that that was something that women always have been very good at. Sometimes you hear articles I read that, oh, women are not good at networking. And I thought, no, we are good at that. So that's a myth. We are good at that. It just depends what we look at when we think about connecting with each other. And I think connecting, if you do that with purpose, where we do things that we want to benefit others and ourselves, we are really, really good at it. So I just wanted to just quickly share with you that Win was born uh, 24 years ago, actually, to empower, to connect and develop women uh, primarily, but also bring along the men who wants to be part of it as we inspire a world that works for all. We have a learning model where we look at both the work and the world and you. So it's all interconnected parts. So when we come together, we, we know that we have to grow as individuals uh, to contribute to a better workplace and also have impact on the world. And we drew so through seven pillars that we are standing on. And one is global, bringing together people in different countries and different diversities. Uh, one, we want to make practicality so that we can actually go and do something about it and be the person that radiates what you want to do in the world. We want to look at new solutions, so are innovative, interconnected. We know that everybody and everything is connected and how we do what we do matters. And we are encouraging each other to go on our own journeys to 
uh, explore and discover who we are. And that's the part of authenticity that's so important, particularly for women today. And we are holistic and holistic means this balance between the feminine and the masculine. Most of our work has been that of the feminine to create the balance, but ultimately we need both. And we want to focus on possibilities. So this is not a place where we're just complaining, but we are sharing what is, and from there we are looking at what could become. So with that, I'd like us just to already go into little groups. And um, just want to share one thing as we go, because there's some people haven't been to win before. So we go into small little groups and we quickly ask you to share who you are, what you do, and then one more thing. And today we want you to look at some of these qualities of the feminine. And um, when we do so, you would normally be about three people in the group. And we ask you to find one timekeeper and to make sure you give the same time to each person. So if you happen to be in a group with more people than three, because it could happen, uh, just ha ha train yourself also in making sure everybody speaks. Uh, so that's important. You can either take the time or even follow that, you know, make sure everybody speaks so that it is a, a, an exchange that works also this one for everybody. Uh, I just wanted to say one more thing about some of these qualities of the feminine, because I was reflecting the other day on one that we can call beauty, okay? And beauty, we don't mean this um, aspect that is, oh, to put on or nail polish or high heels or, or not like that necessarily. But we mean more this thing of maybe, you know, appreciating uh, that in your office, maybe someone has put a flower there or the way someone speaks, that instead of in harsh language, it's, just, it's a gracious language, uh, something that warms our heart, so that beauty is an element of uh, what we value, art, that we bring in artistic uh, things into our lives, into our world, and we give it value. Okay, I'll tell you just an example. Sometimes at the big wind conferences when we meet live, you know, in our budget, we have flowers, we have music, we have many things. And sometimes I've, I've been confronted with people who say, Christine, Christine, because we needed to cut some costs, you know, difficult with money. You know. And everybody goes, let's cut on the artistic uh, things. You have spent so, so much on music, cut the flowers, cut on these things. And I said, no. We don't do that, you know. We don't cut on scholarships, we don't cut on flower, we don't cut on music. So it is easy to say, oh yeah, I value these things, I want art. But we actually have to make an extra effort because the world would like you to cut. They would like you to just, you know, don't have any of that. Let's build an office, but let's make it all square and no <laughs> all square and no art on the wall. No, you know, and it doesn't need to be expensive, but it's something you have to take a stand for. So that's that one aspect. Then also sometimes another aspect is, is of the feminine, we can say, okay, no, we talk a lot about analytics. We have AIs, the computer can give us all sort of numbers, everything we need from the AI system. But we also have our internal operating system Sometimes you just know it in your heart or you feel it in your gut. And we need to learn to really also trust that. In combination, sometimes we need both, but it is not to be a slave to the AI. In fact, we need to really, really develop our internal system. And when we are together to, 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 to also be alert to what is something that's good for us and what is not. You have goosebumps, this feeling, you know, listen to it. And that's something part of the feminine world that we must not forget. Another part is that of long-term thinking, you know, perhaps in your workplace, sometimes it's easy to come up with a fast, cheap solution, but perhaps by creating a good process, by thinking about nature, by thinking long-term, it will be more efficient in the long run. And you see the consequences we have had on pollution on the planet because too many are thinking too short term. And again, it sometimes is hard. We have to work for it because there will be pressure. So you'd say no, no, and <laughs> of the no again. So that's my experience that these, these values that uh, we can say come from the feminine, but that are in women and in men are, are it, it's not enough to just like them. You had to take a stand for them. So with that, uh, I asked Juliana to put on the slide with the questions for our little groups. 
and we can go in. So we start immediately sharing with each other. So here is what we like to do. So who you are, what you do, you can do that quite fast, but at least, you know, and if you are a shy person, doesn't matter, you share it anyway. And, and we therefore try to give each other the time that's needed. And, and think also about, is there any, um, quality that we can put in the category of the feminine i mean and again this is just labels so so it's not it's a human it's for everybody is there something here that you would like to give value in both uh, from within yourself or something also that you can see in the outside world okay fantastic well did you have a good time in the groups yes got to share Talk. Yeah. Good. Oh, excellent. I'm so glad to hear. So I would like to introduce our three speakers today. And um, I'd like to start with Night Muteti. She's the founder and executive director of Daughter of Kenya. And she's an, ex an experienced gender expert who in 2017 founded Daughter of Kenya, a national trust organization whose mission is to create sustainable models that rescue, educate, and empower vulnerable girls and young mothers in Kenya. So welcome, it's, it's great to have you here. Uh, we also have today and tonight for her, Megumi Ishimoto with us today. And um, she's the executive director and the co-founder of NPO Women's Eye. She now has founded a single mother research project to collect appropriate data and voices of single mothers and children impacted by COVID-19 to use the data for policy advocacy. Wow, I now want to uh, introduce a fellow Norwegian who is with us today from Niger, and that is Tina Tinde. She started off in her early days um, also being one of the early people doing diversity and inclusion inside many of the large um, UN organizations that I know has been um, also quite an advocacy in itself, uh, working in Red Cross and Red Crescent national societies and served in two UN peacemaking operations, both in Cambodia, Cambodia and ex-Yugoslavia. So maybe I'll start with Tina because I want to hear what she is doing now uh, in Niger and, uh, and, and working on there. Please share a little bit about your project, Tina. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm here in Niger on, um, on a six month mission to head the office of the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies. So this for me, I feel it's a, it's a golden opportunity to have uh, a feminist uh, be in charge of a humanitarian office. So uh, I think that uh, my managers had asked just about everybody who could be eligible for that job and nobody seemed to be ready to go. So when they asked me, I said yes immediately. Um, I, until two weeks ago, I was the only uh, female head of office of our organization in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. We have, uh, we have 15 uh, delegations that uh, cover a few, few more countries for each delegation. So I thought that this was really something where you have to take one for the team and you have to go. And of course, it was not a very big sacrifice because um, the situation for people from Niger, it's just so many, many times more difficult than it is for me to come here. I mean, I have a driver who drives me in a gigantic four-wheel drive car to and from the office. I have air conditioning in my office. There are security guards everywhere. I have money so I can buy food. I do not have to worry about flooding uh, of my building, although I did have two leaks in the, on the um, first floor of my house. I did have that, but that was nothing dangerous. Uh, so I would say that the, the population here uh, is uh, in a country which is on the lowest rank of the um, Human Development Index uh, of the UN, 189 out of 189. Uh, so their access to healthcare, their ad access to education, it's really, really low. Uh, I think about 40% of girls in Niger, they are married before they are uh, 18 and uh, large numbers before they are 15. Um, and uh, about 40 to 45 percent of the country is living in extreme poverty. Um, mm -hmm. There are uh, climate um, climate disasters. There is uh, there's migration going through Niger on the way from Senegal and other countries on their way to Libya and on their way to, to Europe. Uh, and there are conflicts in all the countries surrounding Niger. And here there is not a civil war, but there are 
country, uh, there are conflicts spilling over from Burkina Faso, Mali, Chad, uh, and Nigeria. So we are on actually high alert in this country because there are attacks linked to these groups. It's jihadist groups, extremists, uh, and uh, in the capital, it's quite, uh, it's quite safe, but we have just been told to avoid hotels. So, um, yeah, so this is, a, I think this is a very, um, you know, very interesting task for me to be here. And I'm trying to put uh, gender sensitivity into everything we do. And, um, and this is being very welcomed by, by my colleagues, by our donors, because uh, gender issues, prevention of gender-based violence, women's leadership, it is being recognized, um, at least on, on paper, at least in meetings, especially on the 8th of March, this is being highly recognized, but it, it's also that it has to be implemented. So, so I do feel that um, together with my colleagues, I think that we're quite useful in putting in uh, practical uh, activities that can be done so that women and children are being consulted and being able to be taken seriously when we make um, strategies and, uh, and surveys of how to best deal with uh, disaster reduction, uh, other um, development uh, activities, etc. Tina, it's so amazing this thing to have someone like you with a gender sensitivity. And of course, this can also happen that men take on projects towards gender and of course nature and other matters as well. Megumi, I want to hear also about you because you left your finance job and you went out to the Fukushima area after the tsunami and the, and the disaster. Tell me what brought you into that and what are you doing today in your project? Thank you, Kristen. Um, it's, it's, I'm happy again that so you invited me here uh, for this special session. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Megumi. I'm in, in Japan. Um, uh, I've, I'm a founder of a uh, nonprofit Women's Eye. We do um, a lot of, uh, we focus on women's empowerment, especially in disaster uh, recovery area. When I was working for uh, General Electric, that is the American company in Japan, the uh, financial sector, I just quit and I moved to uh, the disaster area and ex I didn't expect to, to work for gender equality, but I just faced so many uh, difficulties that women were facing. So I created the, um, just a nonprofit uh, focusing, supporting only women, providing food, providing clothing, providing whatever they need. And then uh, started to create a place that women can get together and talk about their issues and which include of course domestic violence and you know, difficulties that they face and gender inequality in the community and then I realized that this is not only about the disaster period so uh, I incorporated my nonprofit and the changed the name uh, Women's Eye that is uh, that we thought it's very important so since then we've been working of for especially in remote area, uh, women's empowerment, women's leadership, uh, gender equality, uh, anything we need to do, we do. Um, we held over 1,000 sessions for women um, and more than 10,000 women has participated for last 10 years. And last spring, uh, you know, right after the COVID-19 pandemic, I just immediately remember the, uh, the, the who is who is a vulnerable woman right now. Mm -hmm. Then I thought it's a single mother uh, that was, they were also suffering 10 years ago, right after the disaster as well. So I, I coordinated and uh, launched a single mother research project, a uh, consist of nonprofit researchers and gender specialists, you know, about 10 people and, uh, who are working for to support single mothers and the issues. And so since then, uh, we did a survey of 1,800 single mother household in last July. And then we decided to, you know, keep continuing the research. So uh, every month we do a same 500 single mother household. Uh, we do a research. So from last August, Till now, so it's almost one year. So we mm. have a lot of data, uh, and because I knew, I kind of 
uh, I learned in uh, right after the disaster, what I was miss, what I, what I should have done was that I should have collected more data and the voices right, right there so that I could use it for a policy advocacy uh, to change the, you know, things around. Yeah. I mean, this is so, so smart. Let's learn from her, you know, because you said you did it one time without the data. No, you're doing it. And, and, and I think that's, uh, and I think that's the way for policy advocacy. You have the numbers you can, you can share. So we want to hear more about the impact. I want to hear a little bit more right now from Knight also, who is also a founder who initiated something uh, herself. And Knight, please share how you started, what you do and what you are doing. So everybody's learning more about that. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for inviting me to this incredible uh, forum. I would like to start by sharing my journey. First and foremost, I would say that I was brought up in the rural Eastern Kenya, Makweni County. And that way I was born to a mom. My mother was a teacher. She's still a teacher as a firstborn. And my dad was a human rights uh, defender. So greening up, uh, I really wanted, I liked what my dad was doing. He would fight for people's rights, the vulnerable, and to me, it was just in me. Sometimes I would accompany him to meetings and all that. So uh, I used to I used to say one day I'll change the lives of many women because going to school, you see girls messing themselves the day of the sanitary pads and all that. And me, mm -hmm. to me, it was just inside me. I want to change the lives of other girls because However much, I was not much privileged, but I was better. But I wanted to see girls from the rural setup living and enjoying a full life and doing great. So after high school, my parents had another plan. They took me to Jomo Kenyatta University uh, of Agriculture and Technology to pursue information technology. But me, I didn't want to do that. So I told my dad, um, no, I want to go to the University of Nairobi. I want to do social sciences. I thank God because my dad listened to me. He supported my dream. And I found my way. After one year in another university, I found my way, University of Nairobi, doing a... Uh, Doing, I started with sociology, communication, and I later specialized with uh, social work. So ideally, I did what exactly I wanted to do. After school, uh, during the school, uh, I did my volunteership with GIZ UNHR program. It was called Urban Refugee Program. They're taking care of the refugees in Nairobi region, in the Nairobi informal settlements. And I had a lot of learning there. Later, I went to CMD Kenya. It's a multi-party. It supports political parties, but I was a gender officer there. And there, being there, I was able to learn a lot, interacting with women leaders and, you know, to the rural setup, working with them. That, that was like six months. And then after that, I went to the caucus for women leadership, where I worked as a program, uh, a program officer for one year. Then from there, when I was in caucus, I remember I was searching for organizations that could mentor me. That was 2014. If Christine, you can remember very well, I found when I wrote to you. That time I was just a little girl and in turn with caucus. And my, my employer really believed in me. She even sent a letter for me for the embassy, but the embassy kept rejecting my my you know me coming to 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 the win conferences but you know what later i i started looking for a lawyer we did the trust deed and registered uh then daughters of kenya that was 2016 and that's how i was able to come for my first ever conference to win in in italy that was my first trip to europe i really thank you win and there i became a very good leader you can see now where we are it's because of all what that we learned in i have been able to learn in win i have grown to be a very good leader yeah as we talk now daughters of kenya just turned five years and we are very happy because now we are we are now celebrating five years. We have now just done our, and reviewed our first strategic plan. We are going to review it next month, actually. We are planning, plan international Kenya have sponsored the conference in, and we are happy to say that we are going to, you know, we are going to lodge it next month. As we lodge, we want to celebrate five years of Daughters of Kenya since inception. So thank you. It is because of when even I 
met some of the potential partners like the D Groot Foundation mm -hmm. and many others who believed in my dream and they 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 really supported us even we did have any kind of structure so we really i really appreciate and twin is a very good opportunity and great one for me and many other infernable girls in kenya so going straight what i do is that our mission is to rescue educate and empower the vulnerable girls and young mothers in Kenya. Ideally, we target uh, the vulnerable teenage girls from the age of, you know, from as early as 12 all the way to 18 years through two strategic programs. That is fostering education and ending violence against girls. And, and when we talk about ending violence, we talk about FGM, child marriage, and all forms of GBV. And the vulnerable young mothers is from 12 years to 30 because they can be as small as, you know, they can be as young as 12 years as mothers through the empowerment for sustainability project which is which is more of a sustainable livelihoods and also mm -hmm. the sexual reproductive mm -hmm. health and rights program yeah thank Maybe you no. the story is so long let me just stop there it's so long and i'm very yeah. grateful because it's a dream come true Thank you. Yes, and I will let you, you can share a bit more also <laughs> after. But it is very interesting to hear you. You're totally unstoppable, you know, such an inspiration. <laughs> and, uh, and it is very nice to hear this story because Win has always given out, you know, we are always trying to make it global and assuring that we include uh, young women from different countries and not only young, also all ages actually. And, it, and, and then we know, and it's so nice to hear that the impact of connections made are rippling out and, and, and that's the whole point. So, so very glad to hear that. Tina, I want to hear a bit more now on the project and your gender sensitivity to what you're doing and how that, uh, how that is impacting and, and what you plan to do to maybe Oh, there you are. National Federation of Red Cross, Red yeah. Crescent Societies, yeah. <laughs> yes, this is, uh, thank you so much. And I'm so inspired uh, listening tonight and Megumi. And uh, thank you again, Christine, for bringing us together. Um, I think this, we really have to do this because the patriarchy uh, would prefer us not to have this meeting at all. Um, and also, I think many years ago, it, would, it wouldn't be possible, not only because we didn't have internet, but also because it was mainly men who had the time to sit around and have a meeting in a, on, on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, women were too busy. So, so now uh, how I try to integrate gender equality, it's, um, it's something, as I said, I've, I usually worked on this now. I've worked now 32 years. I've had 20 jobs, most of them in international organizations. And I see now that my influence uh, just from being here, even one day after I arrived here, I started to be bossy about gender equality. So in, in view of the hierarchies of, of organizations and countries, uh, people listen more to somebody who has been appointed to a, a senior position. And I'm not saying that it's for everybody, uh, but I just uh, want to encourage everybody here to, to not to think that they're not qualified uh, if they feel that they should be leading on some project, as you can see the examples here of Knight and, and Megumi. It's um, women have a higher education level now in the world than, than men. Uh, in, in many countries, especially in Western countries, but it's also uh, very high in many countries. Uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa has a problem in that sense, but women always uh, know best uh, how, to, how to shape the activities that affect them and also children. So what I'm trying to do is, uh, is without irritating uh, the male managers too much, I try to use the adopted strategies and policies that have already been put on the websites, I try to use them and to put the points into speeches, project plans, evaluations, meetings, job descriptions. And since I have written many of those um, contributions to those strategies, I know what's in them. It's very difficult for me to do a, a quick analysis of the website of the African Development Bank, even though I've never worked there, but I know what I can find in their gender, uh, in their gender policy, because it's my friends and colleagues from before who, who, who wrote that. Um, so um, I think it's time now for us as women to hold the, to hold managers accountable to the very good policies and strategies that they have already uh, already uh, adopted. And one example that I'm working on now is to um, to help to prevent the sexual exploitation and abuse of um, people who depend on humanitarian assistance. To 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 help to prevent that, 
it's not enough to have a meeting in Geneva or in New York or in Nairobi. But there are lots of meetings about that. But I think that those at risk, they would they would never even know that those meetings were held. So <laughs> what has to be done at, at the local level is to increase the access to health services, legal services, for those who have been uh, subjected to sexual abuse. And the niche where, you know, where I've been working now for the last few years, which you introduced as my title, which is fine to give an alert to that. The niche is that this is actually humanitarian workers themselves who, who like to work in, in, the, in the humanitarian world so that they can have access to vulnerable women and children. They, they, are, they are basically predators who would go to Haiti, who would go to Ethiopia, or who are there already, and who know that a child who has lost their parents or who has a disability or who is hungry or especially teenage girls, uh, they know how to groom them and they know how to, how to uh, demand sexual services from them. Uh, even older women who are recruited for work for the WHO, IOM, Red Cross movement, sometimes they also are expected to provide sexual services in the evening if they get a small job to, to support a clinic or an awareness raising campaign. So I'm, I'm now putting this into everything and I, I, I do see some raised eyebrows, but this has actually been adopted a long time ago. I mean, I was in Cambodia in 92, 93, and we knew already that the military forces and the civilians were exploiting the local women. I was shocked already then. It's not very uh, difficult to understand that this kind of abuse is contrary to the, to the principles uh, of humanitarian organizations and the UN and, and, uh, and the law in the country. It's not difficult to understand, but, but it's been going on. Budgets have not been dedicated to this. So I would say that in, aside from running the office with 12 people and we're expanding it, but I wanted to talk about beauty. If you can forgive me, because uh, Christine, <laughs> Christine mentioned in the beginning how important it is to have um, beauty around us. And I totally agree. And something that is lighting the spirits of us now here in Yame is that we are renting an extra office space. It's a beautiful building. Uh, you know, it's modest, but it's beautiful with 15 offices. And we will also have a guest house there. So we are buying now fabric. So this is fabric that we could use uh, to have to, this is from Maradi in, uh, in uh, Niger. It's very close to, to Nigeria. I think maybe uh, one of our friends here who's on the line, uh, yeah. she might be recognizing that from the border area of Nigeria. That's Irinma. I also have this, this is from uh, Mali, which is another neighbor country. That's going to be um, maybe a dress for me, maybe other things. So this is something we do, you know, to raise mm -hmm. our spirit and to put, um, to put beauty around us. It's absolutely important. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because I mean, when you walk and you talk and you are living in the sort of darker areas of human nature, such as exploitation, uh, knowing that that's not the only part of our human nature uh, and doing this to lift your spirit is so important. But thank you also for facing those tougher things and speaking up. Uh, I think we all here on the call know how difficult that can be and the consequences sometimes are not only positive. So thank you, Tina, for speaking up because it's just how to keep that going and be unstoppable on that. Megumi, I, I want to hear now, so you mentioned, um, you know, you want to impact on this policy making also with your research and um, Having been to Japan many, many times, uh, I know how modern a society it is. And at the same time, how incredibly conservative it is when it comes to women's advancement. And, um, and uh, this moving mountain type job that you are engaged in, uh, I know is, is a slow process also. But please share, um, share, uh, I want to know a bit more, what is, how, how can you mobilize other women to come with you uh, and the impact of this project? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, I would like to start from the impact of the project so far. Mm -hmm. uh, so after one year research, uh, the Japanese government did a temporary special cash payment for single parent household, yes. which is like about 500 uh, US dollars per children per child each, yes. uh, but it's only uh, with a low income household. Mm. But still, uh, they did it several times, and I don't say that it is uh, in. It is not entirely because of us, but you know, including us because of a lot of effort to push the yeah. government. 
and the uh, for mm -hmm. us we did um, using the one year research uh, data uh, we pub so far we published three issue specific reports that is very critical and we did uh, a lot of press release and press conferences and the so I we use it for the policy advocacy you know like that <laughs> and let me explain but just one example of the uh the, the issue report in mm. this April we released a special report social economic impact of COVID-19 on mm -hmm. children in the uh, single mother household oh, yeah. and the yeah in Japan um according to the report uh, many are you know uh, out of the 500 uh, uh, response. Uh, many are unable to afford the basic foods and some children are losing weight. So survey results shows that 30 to 40 percent of the respondents were frequently or sometimes unable to afford rice or other staple foods every month from last July to this June during the research per, uh, period and responses rose to approximately 50% for meat, fish, vegetables every month for last 11 months. And the, as a result, the number of elementary school children who lost their weight exceeded 11% in Tokyo. In Tokyo, can you believe it? Yeah. In last August, September, and this March, and in this May, the number increased to 12%. And that is like uh, in the summer when they don't have a school, so that they don't have the lunch pack by yeah. you know uh, by the schools, so they couldn't eat much at, at at home, I guess. So and these data are covered by several newspapers and TVs, so mm -hmm. that also pushed uh, the government, I think. Yeah, thank you for doing this because it's it's um, just as the whole world, and if you think about. Japan is a rich country. It's a rich country, and it should it shouldn't happen. And also, the whole world is a rich planet. Let's say so. Is this this distribution of wealth and this distribution of of goods and services and care and share? Um, and it's uh, it's so good to hear you are doing something about it. And I want to move to night. Also, now night. Um, I know you have done. Uh, a lot for the young girls. So share a bit more about this because it was interesting you now when Megumi started to talk about the children in school. And um, so I want to hear from you too. When you work with the young girls, what are your focus? Okay. Uh, one thing is that uh, we look at the what is missing. For instance, for a girl to be, you know, our vision it is to ensure that they attain their full potential. Yeah. And during the COVID, uh, the biggest thing that we identified is that most of these girls could not, you know, the public schools, they, had the, they were giving the sanitary pads to the girls. And during the COVID, close, schools were closed and things were very difficult. Too. As sole daughters of Kenya, courtesy of the Indian Trust in Kenya, they gave us the, the machines, the commercial machines, they, they donated to daughters of Kenya, the Indian community in Kenya. So we were able to do the reusable parts. We were able to, to get the materials. And this is sustainable because it takes over a year. Actually, I, I am happy to tell you that we were able to supply 100 reusable parts to the girls in Pokot. That is the uh, part of Kenya. It is like the western part of Kenya, the Pokot people, we were able to send 100 uh, pads to them. And this one, we worked in partnership with an organization in uh, Narok County, because uh, our areas of operation is Nairobi County, Narok, mm -hmm. Kajiado, and Machakos and Makueni. We were also able, during, during the Menestral Health Day, we were able to supply to 50 girls also in formal settlement called Mokuru in Nairobi. So that was one of the major challenges, the reusable pads. And then parents did have money because the little they could get, they could just buy for their, you know, for their children. So, which is 
to consider is it pads is it food so has we found them as uh, sustainable another uh, opportunity is that through our education program is that we do a lot of mentorship to the girls capacity building and during these mentorship programs uh, we have partnered with kenya institute of social Work and community development we were prevalent mm -hmm. to take some girls to school and some of the achievements is that one of our girls just graduated on friday we are so happy with a diploma yeah. in community health and uh, and with a diploma in community health and development actually and we have two more girls in schools so that's those are some of our yeah. successes not to forget about the 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 you know the weaknesses we the general elections are coming next year so we we can't foresee we don't know what will happen but within our we have now a group of strategic professionals within our organization so it has been a challenge our uh, resources what i identified i could do very well because now i'm back to school i'm doing my MBA in strategic management, I identified some professionals who could work on pro bono to Daughters of Kenya as they work in their organizations. Yeah, yeah. And we've been able to do a very work in a very professional way now. This is uh, amazing. So the impact is is growing uh, yeah. everywhere, it seems. Um, I was thinking about just the last little comment for you from you, because we want to go back into our groups and share more uh, to make sure everybody has a chance to speak. Um, I was thinking about something. So um, this work uh, to really try to change society, workplaces and women's and everybody's lives actually because men benefit also ultimately of uh, self-realized and free women as we are all free you know to choose um where to live and what to do and which school to go to and and healthcare um but sometimes also the the work of being an advocate of of being on the field no matter how unstoppable you are can be tiring and and i have learned from other groups and my own life let's say how the what helps though is when other other when it's valued when the work is valued i think we can keep going and going if it feels not valuable then it's not but can you say one statement of what inspires you before we go into the groups in those moments where maybe you feel oh god this is almost not possible so I'm talking about a one minute statement of something that inspires you in the moments when you feel this is all impossible. Oh, myself? Yeah, one statement, mean one minute. Yes, changing one woman's life is changing the whole community for me. Yeah, good, thank you. One woman's life changes the whole community at that, yes. knowing that inspires you. Yes, very much, yeah. yeah. Tina. Uh, it's a bit similar. I'm also very inspired if I'm able to support one person at the time. Uh, usually yeah. a young woman, of course, it could also be a man, uh, let's say a yeah. gay man or somebody from uh, of African descent. But uh, for me, uh, having that personal contact with somebody, and it's not only because I'm so extremely kind and generous, it's because that they, they give as much back to me as I give to them. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's a win-win. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Tina. Megumi. Uh, yes, I also am um, inspired by the by other women that yeah. when I did a grassroots academy talk that a training program, uh, women's leadership program for 100 women. But it's uh, wh when I first met them, they were so scared, you know, so scared about the people, you know, pulling their you know legs and uh, chatting about them. And then after three years, four years, five years now. Um, many of them are more, more powerful than I am and, you know, more stronger than I am. And, and so it's a first, you know, tiny, brave first step, you know, after five, 10 years become much bigger power for us. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. It's so inspiring to hear how, yeah, the power is, is growing and going out. I mean, I'm looking here in the chat to see if there is any questions? Mostly it is kudos to all. It's so valuable what you're doing and keep it up and make sure uh, you keep inspired in those moments when it is tough.
So we're going to go in the groups. If you are with new people, just quickly say who you are and a little bit about what you do, but don't talk too much about that because we want to also look at what have been difficulty, uh, if there's been any difficulty with some of the feminine qualities in, in your workplace, how we can integrate it and what you can do to raise up other women. In other words, what can, like we just heard that all our, our panelists today are doing things to raise up other women or even raise up men, but to make them in this sort of gender sensitive way. So let's go back uh, into the groups. Um, Juliana, send us out there, please. So we are all coming back. How was, uh, let's see, there are a few people coming in. How was, anyone wants to share how, uh, anything from your group? Afke? I'm, po I'm pointing out some yeah. people that are not here. We had a very good conversation, though it's slightly depressing about uh, the state, uh, how IT can help also the state of the world in terms yeah. of you know the floods why wasn't that announced um, yeah. how can we build yeah. apps and and get young people engaged you know to yeah. uh, uh to work on all the climate change issues uh we talked a bit about uh, politicians not not making enough changes and where we need the female values more than yes. the values which are so focused on profits often and and yeah. uh, getting the economy in shape rather than uh, our social environment and, uh, and what yeah as uh, Eugenia was pointing out this the soft parts yeah. which are not soft at all no they're not <laughs> because the the economic implications of, of something like domestic violence or or things like that uh, are huge you know the children the children are, are abused that they, they are neglected in mm. in, uh, in uh, homes like that and they will not become the citizens that they might have been if they grew up in a safe home. Yeah. Part of my topic. Then. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Afke. Anyone else want to share? Stephanie, you want to? I'm pointing at some people here. Stephanie, just like a quick little thing what happened in your group, unless you were in the same group. I don't think so. No, I was in another group um, with Ying and Charity. And, um, and we. We talk about, um, with, my, with my own words, girls, um, kind of, you know, self-empowered uh, yeah. um, approach of walking the talk and uh, shining our light. And we concluded on we need to keep in touch and, you know, um, yeah. grow strong together. With Thank my own you. words, I hope yeah. that's a good extraction, but, but I think that was the essence of the three of us. Yeah. Anyone else feeling they want to say something? Charity, you want to say something? Or all of you? Yeah. Yes, uh, Stephanie and Yi, we are very wonderful. And uh, we are arranging for Stephanie to offer some, maybe solution to the conflict in some areas in Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, we'll be working on that yeah. after this uh, conference. Mm. Just in the spirit of win, I advise that we keep in touch even after yeah. this uh, Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Charity. Megumi, you want to say something else? We had a, we kept continuing talking about how the situation about the COVID-19 and how difficult it is. Uh, to take care of children, to how to explain about the COVID-19, why they cannot get together all of a sudden. And it's difficult, but uh, we were just hoping that maybe next year we will be able to, you know, after the uh, vaccinated and everything, that next year maybe we can meet in WING conference. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I mean, I'm looking at the time. I want to thank you for the panelists and thank you for all of you in the group being active and sharing. And um, in the name of truth and reconciliation, we know the situation is not perfect in the world. Many here in the room has also suffered discrimination. Many women in this room has also been subject to abuse. And um, 
And it's, it's a time of healing also, because I think, as some of you just said, I want a new beginning, a new start. And I think use this occasion to accept what is, let it go, put it in the light, as someone just said as well. And there's always a new beginning. And, and, and that is always happening again and again. And, uh, and that's so exciting to be with all of you. And I look forward to seeing you at the conference at other workshops and and to keep the flame going <laughs> i was thinking about the olympics in japan and we have our greek member here too so it's uh, it's so nice to think about that so with that i would like to thank you for being part of this today it was a joy to see you and we are so global that's so great i love that and uh, looking forward to seeing you again. And thank you, Juliana. And also on behalf of the Truth and Reconciliation team, that's sort of the umbrella where Win is participating this week. Also thanking everybody from there. Okay. Thank you. Too. See you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Any